The title is maybe a little bit misleading. We're not just talking about uh, the study in 10 countries. We're also talking about a study that was carried out here in Royal Roads in 2017, 2018, funded by the Royal Roads University Global Advancement Project. Um, and we're going to transition that into a story about how that research has evolved and how we've tried to key it into our own professional networks and turn it into uh, whatever you want to call it, a global, an international, or a transnational study. Okay, so the origins of this project, as I just said, were the, first of all, the Global Advancement Project, which enabled us to carry out the empirical work. Uh, that has resulted in collaboration between uh, myself and Joanna and also Deb Linehan uh, to try to see how this research and this data fits in with what we know of the intercultural and edu international education communities through our own personal research networks. Um, all of this was preceded in 2017 by a workshop at Ryerson University, which was organized by Charles Kruzkopf and Ralph Bowder, which really got the ball rolling in terms of identifying themes and identifying the background literature and issues that could be taken forward. Most of all, the origin of the project is an attempt by myself as an Anglo-Celtic um, white male working with Juana, obviously a female of Chinese descent, to really try to get under the skin of the international student experience, which is what we ended up call, calling the follow-on project. Um, and we're really, really still trying to do that in terms of themes and in terms of research questions, as I'll explain a little bit later. But I'll hand over now to Juana, who will take you through the Global Advancement Project and what that told us. Thank you so much, Terry. So as Terry mentioned, this research project is really triggered by our research interest in international students. It also informed by our professional experience working as a teacher with students on a daily basis uh, through both teaching and, uh, and uh, administration which actually provide us a very unique perspective to understand the integration experience of international students. And uh, speaking of myself, this project actually also reminded myself start my uh, postgraduate education as an international student back into 15 years ago when I started to study in university uh, in US and Germany. So I have to personally go through the process of integration, uh, which made me always find those topics are really fascinating. So Terry uh, Depp and two research assistant, uh, they formed a research team and uh, we worked together to decide the main emphasize the research question. Uh, in this project, we would like to explore. So here is the research question. Uh, what are the informal channels through which international students integrate into their Canadian university and the community? As we really want to understand the student experience from their own perspective, so we carried out a mixed method study of a sample of rural students in order to understand how integration could happen through those informal channels. So a little bit of literature to help us to uh, situate our research in the body of literature. So actually, there are a huge body of literature on integration of international students from very different perspectives and approach, which really speak to the reality of the fast growth of international education and uh, uh, students in universities in the last couple of decades. So here we draw upon the classic distinction, uh, discussion on academic integration and uh, social integration, uh, a conceptual model proposed a few decades ago. And uh, there are a lot of research has been done uh, using this model. And the researchers agreed that 
a high degree of integration into the social and academic environment would really influence their academic commitment uh, to their learning goal as well as to the institutions, which will have a significant impact on their decision to uh, return in the university for studying, or in some extraordinary case, they may have to make difficult decisions. And the research also revealed that uh, the integration actually have a very positive effect on student satisfaction and development in general. So uh, in this project, uh, in particular, we would like to emphasize social integration, social interaction of students. Uh, as social interaction is determined by many different factors, uh, such as the informal peer group interactions, interaction with academics and staff, as well as those extracurricular uh, activities. So there are also some research uh, revealed the positive connections between social uh, integration and academic integration. And the research found that the people who can uh, successfully adjust uh, to the social cultural environment, uh, it will also have positive effect on their uh, academic performance, academic integration. So another line of literature uh, related to social integration is about cross-cultural adaptation. So social interaction is also found a very strong predictor of um, cross-cultural adaptation, which helps students to adapt to the new cultural environment, which also lead to the long-term uh, settlement in the host countries. So uh, we've, there are a lot of uh, research on how international students could make intercultural friends, and the friends can actually uh, help them to uh, better uh, so integrate to the environment socially. And we revealed a couple of research conducted in different uh, uh, cultures. So for instance, uh, in 2014, uh, one survey conducted by the Canadian Bureau of International Education, uh, which surveyed more than 3,000 uh, international students at 25 universities and colleges across Canada. And they found that 56% uh, of respondents reported having no Canadian friend, students as friends. So this piece of research finding actually is quite identical, quite consistent with other findings. Uh, conducted both in the U.S. and in the U.K. So why making intercultural friends is so important for social integration? And uh, there is also a line of research on social capital, uh, which found that the integration actually uh, can only occur when there is a possibility to engage with, both, with members of both one's culture of origin and the new culture. So in other words, those different types of social capital would also help students to integrate at a different stage. For instance, they're uh, connected to the uh, friends of their own cultural origin, or they're connected with the dom both domestic and international students, as well as the social capital would help them to expose to the community and organizations for career development and long-term settlement. So we used a, a mixed method to conduct this research uh, in order to hear experience and stories from students, including both domestic and international students. And we also gathered insights from uh, our faculty and the staff. So in total, there are about 68 participants in our research project. And we conducted two pilot interviews to gather some insights which helped us to form the research. And we also conducted an online survey include both uh, international and domestic students, as they both play a very important role in the integration experience, integration process. We also invited the uh, faculty and the staff in the survey as well as a focus group discussion. Uh, we hosted an event at the Center of Dialogue uh, to hear the 
those successful stories and experience from our students, staff, and the faculty. And uh, we get a lot of insights from our community help us to move forward in this project. So here, I also want to direct you to a web page uh, we created as a, a research team. So in this uh, website, you can find the background information about the research project. And also, uh, we have some research findings uh, summarized by the research team, uh, Ty uh, Terry and Deborah and myself. And uh, the research findings is summarized in uh, a file in the PowerPoint format. So we also posted the, the findings there. And feel free to check it out and let us know if you have any. Uh, we would love to hear about your insights to help this uh, project, help the research to uh, move forward. Thank you. So due to the limited time of this presentation, so I think uh, I probably can only share one piece of insights from our uh, findings so far. Uh, so this is uh, uh, particular about how international students make intercultural friends. Uh, as we mentioned, the intercultural friends play a very important role in social interaction and social uh, <coughs> integration. So we ask our students to identify uh, where do your friends here in Canada from. So here is what we find from the uh, data. So we can see that although 100% of the students had hoped they would meet or get to know lots of Canadian students and making friends with them. And a large number of them feel the wish uh, wasn't fulfilled. And only a very small percent of uh, international students, less than 5%, reported that they have domestic Canadian students as friends. So this research finding actually is quite consistent with those uh, findings from previous research and the literature. And we also asked a couple of questions uh, with international students and to see whether they have chance to uh, interact with both international and domestic students and make friends with them. So uh, more than half of them haven't really had a chance to uh, have a meal with the domestic students. And uh, more than half, 59% of them haven't had worked or volunteered um, with the domestic students. And during the in-depth uh, interviews and focus group discussions, uh, we also invited the students to tell more experience and the stories uh, from their own perspective using their narratives. So we, ident we identified several themes related to uh, service expectation, access, skills, as well as networks. So in general, the students are quite positive and they are very satisfied with the, uh, the, the effort and support from the university to help them integrate. And there is also evidence that uh, students are aware of the need to develop new skills and mindset, a global mindset and cultural awareness to help them integrate. And uh, there is a good evidence some students have explored the existing opportunities, both inside and outside the, the community. And the students also hope for more opportunities to connect, and there is a long way to, to go. So here, uh, I'd like also share a couple of emerging themes and the possible propositions um, developed from our data analysis, from those stories and the experience of uh, students. So as one student put that, at the international showcase, I didn't realize how diverse your roles was until then. <laughs> So it's quite fascinating to hear students really very positive and proud of being part of the Royal Rose community. And also there is a hope they want to really uh, connect to both domestic and international students in the bigger community. So they wish there will be more chance to work with um, 
both for domestic and international students to work and to, to learn together. So this is where they can really contribute to the multicultural uh, learning com community and uh, being part of it. And uh, interestingly, we also hear a very similar voice from our domestic students. Uh, as some of them mentioned, uh, I'm the only domestic student in my cohort. So there is a wish to have more chance to have more balance and then to create those social interactions and uh, communications, conversations uh, with both domestic and international students. So definitely those intercultural friendship and uh, com conversation would help social interaction and support network, which would also facilitate the cultural awareness and uh, uh, sharing to a large extent. Uh, we also find a very interesting theme from our data, which is about intercultural space. So here is a very interesting story from students. Uh, it's about the smokers' uh, corner. So one international student might visit a domestic student on the first day of the uh, school. And they started to talk with each other. And the conversation lasted for two, uh, 2.5 hours. Uh, and the conversation also led to many learning connections and, uh, and the possibilities. So uh, there is also a hope that students want to uh, have those uh, intercultural uh, interactions which would uh, uh, help them to, uh, to reflect on their own cultural ethnicity, their own cultural background, and also to be connected at a more deep level both cognitively and effectively. So it's not only about to learn about the different cultural uh, knowledge, the different cultural perspective. More importantly is for them to really connect the, through those shared emotions, feelings, and they, as we hear a lot of commitment from our students to uh, become an important part of the learning community and also contribute to the uh, learning by, um, by themselves. And we also hear the similar uh, voice and stories from our faculty and the staff, and they have done great work to help students uh, to create a safe space for students to talk openly about their expectations of others or point of view around the leadership, collaboration, communication, etc. So those open and safe space would really help students to move out of their comfort zones and really push their boundaries of intercultural learning to facilitate those cultural awareness for better social integration. So the last uh, slide from my part, uh, another theme is about the intercultural uh, dialogue, which is also a very interesting idea, uh, emerged from the data analysis. So a student would uh, really hope to uh, connect to community, both at the local and uh, international, global level. Uh, for instance, one student mentioned um, a case studying opportunity uh, working with a local community, where students from different programs come together to solve the problem and create more social interaction. So to be uh, connect with the local community would also help them to develop networks for career development and a long-term uh, settlement in the host countries. And um, uh, another student mentioned, uh, this is an Indian international student. So after I arrived in Canada, I become a conduit to other international uh, Indian students who were asking questions about the railroads. So that led me to do research, get accurate information, and meet with people, because I wanted to be a reliable source to my uh, friends in India. So we hear a lot of similar uh, voices. They are very positive to being the cultural ambassador and to uh, bring their learning back to their own culture, uh, their own uh, ethnicity community and to bring their learning to, uh, to them. So uh, this, conne uh, this connecting process, both at the local and global level, 
It's also a process to help students develop their cultural awareness, facilitate learning, and help to develop their confidence. Uh, both at the cognitive, affective, and behavior level for them to better uh, integrate. So in this way, they can really go beyond their own, uh, those possible uh, boundaries due to the language ability, due to the cultural, uh, due to the learning structure, learning styles, as well as the setup of the learning uh, environment and the program. So, um, so this is pretty much uh, uh, insights we learned from our student. And uh, we also aware that the, um, the host culture uh, environment of those international students, for instance, the cultural origin of their home country, the policy environment, and also would also have a huge impact on their motivation, on their approach. Uh, on their strategy to integrate to uh, university in Canada. So which also lead us to uh, uh, some other directions for future research at the next stage. So I will pass over the podium to Terry for him to continue. We found ourselves, both Wana and I found ourselves going into the spring and summer last year and attending conferences and meeting friends that we occasionally collaborate with, co-authoring, co-researching. And we want to talk about this, and, and that's where I'd like to take you forward from now and, uh, and share with you what I, I hope will become um, another, a, a way of reaching, reaching out from Royal Roads and feeding back into Royal Roads on the basis of a broader experience and an understanding, I think, of how complex the international student is. When we think about it, what are the predominant factors in the, in the way in which we in Royal Road see it? Well, language is one. English is the common language here. English is the language of instruction. Um, but is that the case for all international students everywhere? No, it isn't. Uh, and so we wanted to see what are the, we wanted to tease out whether this was a, a globally representative study covering all the themes that all international students experience, or maybe does it go a little bit um, wider than that? So. We thought at the end of this, well, we've, we've mapped some kind of issues around the broader issues of policy and environment in a range of countries, but we'd need to go further on them. Uh, we need to look more deeply into the respective roles played by host country factors and country of ori origin factors in adaptation to university and community. This is from the IB literature. The idea of the host country, home country dichotomy is used in, in, in business research in order to show how some companies um, and some products and processes work more successfully or less successfully as a function of one or other of those two, uh, those two ends of the gamut. In other words, here, when we see that such students aren't integrating properly, we have a tendency to say, some of us, and probably more of us in the past had a tendency to say, uh, that's because Indian students do this, that's because Nigerian students do this, that's because and we tended to attribute it to the home country factors of the students, rather than doing what is a more intercultural thing, which is to think of it, well, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we in the host country doing? Uh, and you know, if we, are we, are we really created the right context, the right platform for these students to move beyond being Chinese students or Nigerian students? Um, so that dimension, I think, is one that we'll look into a little bit more extensively and, uh, as we move forward. Understanding pathways for long-term settlements in host countries. Canada is, of course, the gold standard in terms of having an open door for international students beyond the period, beyond the duration of their study. Uh, students, international students in, in many other countries don't get that sense of perspective. They don't get that sense of longevity in their stay. They, th they know that they're there just for the purpose of getting a degree and usually going back home. So that changes the mindset. Looking at variances in language practice and cultural traditions from an IS perspective, go back to the language issue here, and I'll mention that again in a moment to illustrate it. I think it's an interesting one about um, what environment the international student faces and how they have to navigate their way through issues of language and culture. So Joanna and I talked to our friends at international conferences and I've got to say, I mean, I, I was absolutely shocked by the response that people had. 
Uh, it made me think that I'd kind of uh, come, ac come across gold dust or something. People just, I think people, people a lot of the colleagues in, in, in our field have become a little bit uh, wary of the, of the policy and strategy dimensions, the international student issue. In other words, national government policy and organizational higher educational strategy. Uh, that, that this thing that is basically about young people going out and learning to become global citizens, being subordinated to issues of economic objectives, immigration policy, political fluctuations in political policy. And the actual student perspective idea is one that a lot of people are really, really keen to embrace and, and, and to take further. And the student-based view is, of course, very, very important. Um, we, uh, we know that that's pretty extensively adopted in many English-speaking countries now. It's not, maybe not so much in other countries, and I think that's one of the reasons why colleagues from Finland, France, um, Germany, uh, Australia have, 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 have really taken to this idea. This is just a couple of interesting things here, just in the conversations that I had at conferences. A colleague in Poland said that he, he was really interested in the project because they've, they've only just began, began to receive international students, and the international students are coming from Ukraine. These are students in the past who would have gone to Russia, but are now going to Poland uh, for their higher education or for their international higher education experience. Uh, we haven't, I haven't bottomed out, I haven't, haven't talked through in detail yet what the language strategies are that they're adopting, but there is clearly a kind of a political and a linguistic dimension to that with regard to issues of power that, that, that students are living every day. They're making a conscious decision to go against the grain of, of many Ukrainian habits and expectations on a political, uh, on a political level. Uh, another thing I'm very familiar with is that in, in French universities, in French business schools in particular, the issue is most, there are really students know that teachers aren't happy because a lot of French professors have been told that they have to teach in English all of a sudden and they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And they're having to teach in English because the French business schools are telling international students that all of their courses will be in English in France. So you can imagine the tensions that French colleagues are finding. Okay, so these are just some dimensions. So what we decided to do is see whether we could turn, turn these connections, turn, turn this enthusiasm into some kind of collaboration. And really, there's not an awful lot of detail to this. I'll, give you, I'll try to give you a sense of who's involved and where we're trying to go and how we're getting there. Uh, and this is not adopting any particular template that I've come across. This has really just been developed on the hoof. And any, any, any advice that anybody can give about any dimension of this is very welcome because it's, it's actually pretty, pretty complex. Okay, so we're all unfunded, but we're all enthusiasts. We do plan to try and get together, and I'm going to be talking to Vanessa later in, the, later in the morning to see whether we can try to get some support to bring these colleagues to the Royal Roads campus and, and to try to uh, move the project on uh, by being there face-to-face -face and spending time in a great environment and uh, then going back to our separate places. We have 11 members and universities in Canada, USA, France, Poland, Australia, Finland, and Germany. All totally voluntary. Nobody had their arm twisted. Nobody was told by their dean that they had to do it. It's just really a bunch of people who, who want to look at the international student work and contact and experience they have from the student's experience, from the student's point of view, as far as our research methods allow us to get there. Uh, the primary disciplines involved in terms of the backgrounds of the people are intercultural communication, linguistics, business, geography, and economics. Um, we've just been, since, since the end of the project at the, in, in April, we've been doing some forming and norming, and I'm just going to take you through a few experiences here. We tried to communicate on Google Plus and email, and here's me, the, uh, the intercultural instructor and professor and, and researcher who really tries to initiate various forms of communication. Three months, fails completely, and kind of says, what did I do wrong? <laughs> um, sending out messages and not getting replies from people. Um, 
uh, giving replies and sometimes having them misinterpreted and not dealing with it immediately and letting, letting some issues snowball. Um, not allowing people sufficient space and time to develop their, develop their point of view and not understanding how different kind of working styles and different kind of working environments might, ex might, might retard or accelerate the, what a person can commit to or, or not at a particular point in time. All of these things uh, were, were pretty painful for the first, first three months through June. Uh, very different expectations of rationale, process, and outcomes. And it was, un there was, uncertain, it was un unclear to me whether the individuals were working as individuals or whether they were working within a faculty agreement or a university agreement and what effect that might be having on, the, on, on, the, on, on their behaviors. So what could we do? I went away on holiday at the beginning of July and thought, what am I going to do, do about this? And I sent out a questionnaire and just tried to create some space where people could tell me what they, what they were feeling, what, they really, what was really motivating them, and what kind of energies and enthusiasm they could commit. Um, and just to summarize the, the feedback, um, and this tells you a little bit about the project, I think. We asked people why they were doing it. What, what, what is this project for? And the predominant reply was that people, all the other researchers, wanted first and foremost a better deal for students. I mean, we gave them six or seven options and then they could say anything else they wanted to as well. And not surprisingly, the, the one that follows won't surprise you, we also asked them to what extent they were doing it primarily for research outputs and publications. Well, that was part of it, but it wasn't as important as getting a better deal for students. Uh, a little bit lower down the scale was we asked them whether, whether it was about their career development. Do they want to develop international networks and things like that? And yes, that was there too. And in addition, two or three colleagues mentioned specifically that they saw teaching and program development as a high priority. So the spread was pretty broad. Most people didn't exclude any of the options, but they prioritized one or two right at the top was the main, main pattern of response. And getting a better deal for students was number one. Um, this, was, this was the one that was pestering me because I just couldn't, I just couldn't get, the, get the project going. Anyway, in the end, I kind of tried to persuade everybody to commit to a particular kind of communication pattern. And uh, the, the compromise was that everybody agreed that when they receive an email from me or from anybody else, they will try to reply within five days. And then I twisted the arm further still and said, well, you know, how about a holding response? If you can't do anything with it immediately, why not just say, got your email, busy now, back, in, back to you in, in a few days' time? Um, because some colleagues, um, you know, have, we, we all operate within our working culture, and I think we all know we can put numbers of days on kind of response patterns and things like time. Maybe we don't do it systematically, but we have a sense. But the variation was massively wide that some people we're just not thinking that a response was needed. Some people were thinking the response would be okay in 30 days. Some people were replying straight away after a day. And so just to try to make the project manageable, we tried to squeeze them into a little bit of a, a box here. More importantly, what do we do with the data? Um, and I've been involved in a number of international teams, and this doesn't often appear to be a very big problem, but normally by the time of the end of the project, it does become a big problem. Uh, everybody thinks that if they contribute data, they should be able to use the data. Okay. But do they need to discuss using the data before they actually go away and use the data? Because some of the data they're using wasn't generated by them, it was generated by, by others. Is it, is it right to go away and use that data? without getting some kind of agreement, consent. So intellectual property is something that everybody agreed we need to have, an, have a position on from as early as possible. And um, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm on the sub-team that's working on this. So if anybody has any models of this, I'd be delighted to hear about them because you know, getting a model of intellectual property that works across eight different countries 
I imagine is going to be a difficult one to write from scratch. So please, please let me know if you have any ideas on that. And I'd love to talk to you. Okay, we divided, rather than have everybody working on all of the project objectives, we divided up into five projectives, starting off with um, issues of project management, data, IP management, etc. This is one I thought I'd show you because I think this is quite important um, from, for people from Royal Roads to see. We, everybody accepts and knows that the, the, global, the, the Global Advancement Project was the basic genesis for this idea. Um, they don't know very much about it. They love the idea of appreciative inquiry. And as I said, they love the idea of the student experience perspective. Um, but we obviously designed a set of research instruments. We designed research questions, research instruments, and we've got a load of data. Um, and we said, well, we'd, we, we we're happy to provide that to you. We don't really expect the ISE project to replicate exactly what the Global Advancement Project did. Um, but we, we like, we, we'd be happy for you to look at our methodology. And so we put together a team that doesn't include any, that doesn't include Wanner or myself. And basically these people will take, a, will take a look at our materials, at our research instruments and research questions. And they will then formulate refer, research questions and, and instruments for the entire project. Uh, I don't know how much they'll resemble our project. By the end of the, by the, end of the deliberations in six months time, it could be very different. They could design something based on the concept of critical thinking, for example, which a lot of people are worried about uh, sending their students to English-speaking universities. Uh, they don't really know what critical thinking is, <laughs> and the students have difficulty with it. It's, it's a big issue in the, in the global community. But who knows what they'll come up with, but it's up to this team to make, that, to make the proposal. Okay, so what's this all about? Really, we want to put a human face on the subject of international students. But it's not necessarily a Chinese face or a, or a Nigerian face. It's a human face. It's about seeing them as individuals rather than groups and national groups. Uh, we want to improve the broad experience they have in host countries. We want to build a sustainable network of like-minded scholars. And we want to identify, going back to critical thinking and a number of the issues of adaptation, social capital, that, that um, Wana used in describing our project. We want to identify generic and specific themes in a global study, which makes sense in a national context and vice versa. And we obviously then will look to write it up in a publication. Uh, it's got about a, an 18 month timeline from uh, the beginning of October. And uh, every, all of these teams are working on the different elements, cross referring, and then we actually design the research instruments, uh, distribute them in, the, in the, all of the universities, and then Juana and her sub-team have the responsibility of analyzing the data when the data comes back in. Um, and then we discuss what we do with the data when it comes. So that's it basically, just some references to finish off with.